Hello, I'm Ross Royden, the Vicar of Christ Church Kowloon Tong here in Hong Kong. Welcome to what has now become our weekly broadcast service of the Eucharist. A special welcome to anyone joining us from outside of Hong Kong. Just as COVID-19 is no respecter of geographical borders, so too our faith transcends all boundaries and barriers. Please see our Facebook page for the link to today's service and for more information. Search on Facebook for Christ Church Kowloon Tong. Christ Church itself will be open for private prayer from 8 a.m. to midday on Sunday. The sacrament from this broadcast celebration of the Eucharist will be reserved and will be available by request during this time. We are in Eastertide, the time after Easter until we celebrate our Lord's Ascension to return to the Father on Ascension Day. During the season of Easter, we use the special greeting we first used on Easter Sunday. I say, Alleluia, Christ is risen, and everyone replies, He is risen indeed, Alleluia. Please remember to join in wherever you are watching or listening. This broadcast is produced in-house, so I hope you will take that into account when watching and listening. However, all services, in whatever form they take, should be not about professionalism and performance, but about participation. We hope that this broadcast enables you to participate in some way in the sacred mysteries. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Hear the words of comfort our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear what St. Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear what St. John says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy.
Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Collect and Readings for this week, the sixth Sunday after Easter. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, beginning to read at the 22nd verse. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they should live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from the first epistle of St. Peter, chapter 3, beginning to read at the 13th verse. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit 
in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, as it is written in St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning to read at the 15th verse. Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Last week, we saw how Jesus told his disciples that one of them would betray him, that another would deny him, and that he would be going away and leaving them. Understandably, they are troubled by all this. And for the rest of what we know as the farewell discourse, he seeks to offer them comfort and reassurance. Jesus may be going, but he tells them he is going to prepare a place for them a place in his Father's presence, and he will come again and take them to himself, so that where he is, there they may be also. Jesus has spoken previously to his disciples of how he will one day return in judgment on the last day. The New Testament writers look forward to this day, the day when Jesus will return. This is not, however, the return that Jesus is talking to his disciples about here. The return he is speaking of is one that he tells them will occur in just a little while. Just a little while, that is, from the time when he is talking to them. This return will be about his presence with them during the time before he comes again on the last day. In this more immediate return, he will come to them with the Father to make his and the Father's home in the life of each of his followers. Throughout his ministry, Jesus has promised eternal life to all who follow him. He has done this through a variety of images, figures of speech, he calls them. Now, at last, in his final moments with them before his crucifixion, Jesus explains what eternal life is. In his prayer to the Father in John chapter 17, Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life means many things, but at its heart, it is knowing the only true God. No wonder then that Philip, one of Jesus' followers, says to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. If eternal life is dependent on whether we know the Father or not, it is vital that we know the way to knowing the Father. There is only one way to the Father, Jesus tells them, and they are looking at it. He is the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through him. Indeed, anyone who has seen him has seen the Father. If they want to know the Father, they must believe in him. This is why the first thing Jesus says to them in John chapter 14 is, 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You will see in the footnotes to this verse in your Bibles that there are various ways to translate Jesus' words. The phrase, you believe in God, can also be translated as a command, believe in God. The disciples, however, did not need to be told to believe in God. As good Jews looking forward to when God would send his Messiah to establish his kingdom, they already believed in God. And the reason they were following Jesus was because they hoped he was the Messiah sent by God. What Jesus tells them is that not only must they believe in God, they must now also believe in him. This has been the major theme in Jesus' teaching throughout his ministry. We have seen how it has been his message to Nicodemus, to the woman at the well in Samaria, to those in the synagogue at Capernaum after he had fed the 5,000, to the man born blind in Jerusalem, and to Martha and Mary when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now before Jesus leaves them for a little while, he tells them one more time, to believe in him. Those who believe in him, he says, will become one with him and his father. He and the father will be in the believer and the believer in them. All this is quite amazing, but it seems straightforward enough. By believing in Jesus, his followers will come to know the father through him. Unfortunately, There is all sorts of confusion over what it means to believe in Jesus. The confusion is largely due to the division that occurred in the church at the time of the European Reformation in the 16th century. To cut a very long story short, many in the time leading up to the Reformation had come to believe that the only way to be saved, which was understood as getting into heaven when they died, was by what they did, that is, by their works. Getting into heaven was effectively a reward for good behaviour. The reformers challenged this and insisted instead that salvation was by God's grace through faith. It is by believing in Christ, they argued, that we are saved and not by works. This was a message that needed to be heard at the time. The reformers' teaching, however, was to drive a wedge between faith and works. One of the slogans of the Reformation was sola fide, faith alone. As a result, many Protestants since the Reformation have not been sure what to do with works, while Roman Catholics, on the other hand, have insisted on their necessity. This is an argument that continues to divide those who follow Christ today and divide them quite bitterly. It is because we now come to the New Testament with these sort of arguments and disputes in mind that we run into all sorts of trouble. In chapter 14, after Jesus has told his disciples to believe in him, He goes on to tell them in verse 21, They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. And then in verse 23, Jesus says, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So which is it? Do the Father and the Son come to us because we believe in Jesus, or because we love Jesus and keep his commandments? Is it by believing in Jesus, or by keeping his commandments, that we receive eternal life? The problem all has to do with what we mean by believe. There are two ways of believing. We can believe about or we can believe in. We believe about all sorts of things in every area of our lives. There are a whole set of things in the realm of human knowledge we believe about the world in which we live. 
In science, we believe various theories and hypotheses about the physical world around us. In our relationships, we believe various things about our friends, for example, who they are, where they come from, and what they are like. We believe in something or someone, however, when we act on what we know about the thing or person. For example, in an election, say for the president of a country, we, we learn lots of things about each candidate. We will share various beliefs about each candidate with other voters, regardless of which one we eventually decide to vote for. We will, however, only, only go on to vote for the candidate we believe in. Our decision of which we choose to believe in will be influenced by what we believe about them. But it is different. We can believe a lot about someone, both good and bad, without believing in them. To take another example, imagine finding yourself lost and in great danger. You meet someone who says to you that they can get you out of the danger. What you have to do, they tell you, is follow them and do as they tell you. You then have to make a decision as to whether you believe that the stranger can get you out of danger. You may decide that you do, but you will only believe in the stranger when you follow the stranger as he leads you and when you do what the stranger tells you to do. You could instead decide that the best way out of the danger is to pursue your own path and do it your own way, regardless of what you believe about the stranger. If, however, you follow the stranger and do what the stranger tells you, it's not you that has saved yourself from the danger, but the stranger. When you get to safety, you don't pat yourself on the back and tell everyone how clever you have been. You thank the stranger and tell everyone how wonderful he is and how he has saved you from a great danger. Many don't think they need Christ, even if they do think there is an afterlife. They just assume that God is bound to reward them if they live a relatively good life. Others see following Christ as a form of weakness and faith as an emotional and spiritual crutch for the weak and inadequate. They don't need anyone to help them. They can save themselves. Christ's followers, however, know they have no power of themselves to help themselves. They know themselves to be in great danger and know they cannot escape that danger on their own. They know it is only by believing in Christ that they can get to safety. But believing in Christ means them doing what Christ tells them to do. It means trusting him and keeping his commandments. There are many who see Christ merely as one religious teacher amongst many. Isaac Newton famously discovered the law of gravity, supposedly while sitting under an apple tree. He was the one who then taught it to others. But the law of gravity exists independently of Newton, and if he had not discovered it, someone else would. Furthermore, we accept the truth of the law of gravity regardless of what we think about Newton as a person. That is how some see Christ. Christ may be someone who shows the way to live a good and full and rewarding life. He is not, however, the only one who can show it to us. And his way may not be the best way for everyone. For Christ's followers, however, Christ is not simply the one who shows them the way or is a way. He is the way, the only way. His commandments do not exist independently of him. He is not just one guide amongst many. He is the only guide. He is the only one God has authorized to lead people to his house and show them around, to use Jesus' own figure of speech. Believing Jesus to be the guide, even the only guide, however, is not the same as believing in him as our own guide. Believing in him means we personally and individually have to follow Jesus and do whatever he tells us. 
Believing in Jesus then means believing what he tells us, loving him whatever happens to us, and keeping the commandments he has given us. All his commandments, that is, and not just those we like the sound of. Believing about Jesus is not without its difficulties. Like Thomas, we have our doubts. Perhaps like Thomas, we have doubts about whether Jesus is alive or about the claims made about him in the Bible. It is, however, in principle, not hard to understand what it is we are being asked to believe, to believe, that is, about him. Believing in Jesus and keeping his commandments, however, is hard. And Jesus himself warned us it would be. Believing in Jesus means walking a narrow path and submitting our will, our wants, and our desires to his. It means ultimately being willing to suffer and to die for, for Christ. It is, however, not a path he expects us to walk on our own. He doesn't say, great, you believe in me and want to keep my commandments. There's the path, now get walking. He not only walks with us and beside us, he walks in us. Everything we experience and everything that happens to us happens to him. I really don't think we appreciate the significance of what Jesus is saying here in the farewell discourse, saying for what it means to believe in him and to follow him. I've already alluded to some of the ways that people understand what it means to be a Christian today. For some, it amounts to no more than thinking that Jesus had some good things to say. But even amongst those who take Jesus seriously and can legitimately be described as Christians, there are different emphases in how they understand what being a Christian means. There are four broad approaches. The first is educational. For some, the emphasis in being a Christian falls firmly on what we believe and think about God. For these Christians, doctrine and theology are very important, and it matters that you get what you believe right. Some take this to an extreme and will only associate with those who think like them. But even if they are more tolerant of those with whom they disagree, they see educating Christians in the doctrines of the faith as of first importance. Christians who think like this place a great value on preaching, teaching, and Bible study. They devise and promote courses to help other Christians learn more about God. They are supporters of programs to enable Christians to become more theologically aware and knowledgeable about their faith. The second approach is ethical. For others, the emphasis falls on the ethical and moral teaching of Jesus. They are drawn to the places in the Bible where Jesus teaches his disciples how they should behave and live their lives. The Sermon on the Mount is a great favorite of theirs. They will quote with approval the so-called golden rule, in everything do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. They point to places in the gospel where Jesus says he came to bring good news to the poor and to those in need. Christians who think like this place a great value on welfare and charitable enterprises. Increasingly, Christians who take this approach are stressing the need for churches to be working for what they see as social justice in our world, and they equate this with mission. They're at the forefront of campaigns against oppression and what they see as unfair structures in our world. The third approach is experiential. For others still, what matters is experience and what they feel. This approach has become particularly popular as a consequence of the charismatic movement of the last century. In many ways, this movement was at the time a revolt against what those in the movement felt was an overemphasis on doctrine. Many of those in the movement felt that too great an emphasis on doctrine had led to a dry and cerebral type of Christianity that left people's emotions and feelings out of the picture. Christians who think like this 
place a great value on lively and vibrant worship, and church services are often sensory experiences with bands, modern music, and even sound and light shows. Those who take this approach are often attracted to churches that encourage the so-called spiritual gifts, such as prophecy, speaking in tongues, and healing. When it comes to Christian teaching, what matters is whether it speaks directly to them and to their own personal concerns. The fourth and final approach is ecclesial. For those who take this approach, what matters is the church itself. They appreciate the sense of belonging that comes from being a part of a local church community, as well as the part they can play in the wider church organization. They are concerned with how the church is run and governed and often take an interest in church politics. They will often be the church's most committed members. Christians who think like this place a great value on making sure the church is well supported. They will join the committees and involve themselves in fundraising for various church projects. They are often the ones who keep the church going and who can be relied on to volunteer when work needs doing. Well, I have simplified to make the distinction between the different approaches. Clearly, they are not mutually exclusive and it is more about emphasis than black and white differences. All would agree you have to believe something, that the way you live your life matters, that how you feel is important, and that belonging to a church is useful. But the difference in emphasis amongst Christians is noticeable, and it gives rise to significant differences in how people see being a Christian, differences that cut across the various denominational divisions. Each approach can appeal to the Bible and to the teaching of Jesus for support. Jesus taught his disciples at length about God and himself. He clearly was concerned with how people behave toward one another. He was a person who was not afraid to show his feelings, whether of happiness, anger, or sadness. And he gathered a group of people around himself that he expected would continue his work after his death. I want to suggest, however, that while each of these approaches is important and captures an aspect of Jesus' teaching, they all meet the heart, they all miss the heart of Jesus' teaching when it comes to understanding what it means to believe in him and to be his follower. So, what does it mean to believe in Jesus today? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? and be his follower now. All these different approaches go wrong because they all begin in the wrong place. They begin with and focus on us, our thinking, our doing, our experiencing, and our belonging. Becoming and being a follower of Jesus, however, begins with and comes from God. Jesus, in his final prayer to the Father, will say, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. Jesus tells his disciples, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Being a follower of Jesus does not begin with our choice of Jesus, but with God's choice of us. Being a follower of Jesus is relational, it's all about knowing God and Jesus Christ, whom he sent. It is a relationship that began for God when he chose us in Christ. It begins for us when we are born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus we must be, from above. It is a relationship in which the Father and the Son make their home in us. And as Jesus says, on that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. We begin our relationship with God by believing in Jesus as the way, the only way to the Father. And we live out that, that relationship with Jesus by believing in him alone, 
keeping his commandments and loving him alone, knowing that all our good comes from him alone, and that any good we do, we do through him alone. As our hymn for this week expresses it, Thee will I love my strength, my tower. Thee will I love my joy, my crown. Thee will I love with all my power in all thy works and thee alone. Thee will I love till sacred fire fill my whole soul with pure desire. Amen. Let us confess our faith in Almighty God as we say together, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers today, we remember all those who are victims of disasters, both natural and man-made. We pray for those who are suffering as a consequence of war, violence and hate. We pray for all those in authority and particularly at the moment for all those in China, Hong Kong, and throughout the world responsible for tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. We seek God's healing for all those who are sick or who have recently been bereaved. We ask that they may know God's healing power and comfort. We remember before God, doctors, nurses, and all those who seek to bring help and comfort to those who are sick and fearful. We commit to God any problems, worries, or difficulties we personally may be experiencing at the present time, praying that we may know the presence and peace of God. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promise through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Strengthen Paul, our Archbishop, Timothy, our Bishop, and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Bless and guide our leaders. Give wisdom to all in authority, and direct this community and all nations in the ways of justice and of peace that we may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, 
and of all your saints, we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In the one Spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common good. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It'll become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it'll become for us the cup of salvation. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, 
This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom, all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you but only say the word and I shall be healed. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us.
the body of Christ. The blood of Christ. Let us pray. God, our Father, whose Son, Jesus Christ, gives the water of eternal life, may we thirst for you, the spring of life and source of goodness, through him who is alive and reigns, now and forever. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.